Well, good morning. Are you awake now? <laughs> All right. You have to forgive us. We're trying to find a new frequency for that mic, so that's why that happens. But hopefully you're awake now. If you guys would stand and, and uh, join us in worship. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, and lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, and my life began. And ash was redeemed. Only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet My feet rose to dance When death was arrested And my life began Oh, your grace so free Washes over You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I made prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over. rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand that's when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so free washes over Yes, we're free, free forever, amen. 
You're here at Emmanuel Baptist Church with us. We just want to welcome you if you're a guest with us today. Um, inside, or not inside, I don't want anybody tearing up a chair, okay? In front of you, in the chair in front of you, there should be a little card. If you're a guest, it's called a connection card. We invite you to fig- fill that out with as much information as you like to give us. You can drop that in the offering plate later. Or if you'd like to take it to our welcome desk down in the atrium, we have a free gift for you for that. Or maybe you would like to do this electronically, hands-free, whatever. On your bulletin that you got, there are two QR codes. Okay, it's the funny-looking things on the very front. Take your phone, scan one of them, and it will be your newsletter. It give you information about things going on in our church. Or you can scan the other one, and it's a quick questionnaire. take you like 20 seconds. It's the online connection card, so if you don't want to fill out the paper copy, you can fill it out there. And then we'll get a record of your visit. And also, there's some questions on there about areas of ministry you might be involved in or interested in. Maybe you have kids. You want to know what's going on in our EBC kids or our student ministry or the college ministry. You can kind of let us know that. That way, when we call or we contact you, we'll know what information you're looking for. One quick thing, before we do our welcome, uh, we do want to draw your attention to, we are doing our Adopt-A-College student, which most of them are not here. Some of them are, but some of them are not because it's Labor Day weekend, so a lot of them went home. So we are kind of reaching out to our church family first and asking, we have um, some sign-up sheets for Adopt-A-College student. There's also, if you want information on what is required of you, there's also a a piece of paper with that information on there. So here in a second, when we do the welcome, and we stand up, and we greet everybody, if you'd like to go pick up one of those cards, fill it out during the service, you can drop it in the offering plate, that way it gets back to the office to adopt a college student this year, and be able to connect with them, take them out to lunch, send them goodies, just check in on them, things like that. I know uh, we're missing a keyboard player. And I checked up on her, and she said, hey, something was going on. I just wasn't feeling good today. And we're like, well, we appreciate you staying home, but we want you to feel better, okay? So that's, that's kind of what the things that you would do as an adopt a, a college student sponsor. So with that, we're going to ask everybody to stand up, greet the people around you um, as much as you need to, and uh, have a great time, and we're so glad that you're here.
sing together praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. A praise to the Lord who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth, shelters thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen? How thy desires have been granted in what he ordained. And praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. And ponder anew. What the Almighty can do If with His love He befriend me And praise to the Lord Oh, let all that is in me adore Him And all that has life and breath Come now with praises before Him And let the Amen down from his people again, gladly forever adore him. And let the amen sound from his people again, gladly forever adore him. When we come into the presence of God and we sing his praises, we sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. It's right to respond to that and to think of our own unworthiness, that we don't deserve to come in and, and stand before the King of creation and worship him freely. And uh, as I was looking through these songs this week, I, was asked, or I, I asked myself the question, how do we want to come before the presence of God in our own uncleanness and unworthiness? Do we come before him and hide like Adam and Eve in the garden? Or, as I was reading in Matthew uh, chapter 8, uh, a leper comes before, clean, uh, before Jesus and his cry was, Lord, I am unclean, but if you will, I can be clean. So as we stand before our creator in our unworthiness, how are we going to stand before him? We're going to hide in shame. Are we going to say, if you will, I can be clean. You all can have a seat as we continue to sing, but um, I just want to invite you in this moment before an invitation is extended to come, even in our uncleanness to come. Would you just say that prayer in your own heart right there in your seat? Lord, if you will, I can be clean. And in his grace and mercy, his response to that leper was, I will be clean. sinners poor and needy weak and wounded sick and sore Jesus ready stands to save you full of pity love and power come ye thirsty Come and welcome 
God's free bounty glorify true belief and true repentance every grace that brings you now I will arise and go to Jesus he will embrace me in his arms and in the arms of my dear Savior oh there are ten thousand charms Weary come, become ye weary and heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. And if you tarry until you're better, you will never come now. arms and in the arms of the mighty Savior oh there are ten thousand charms sing that again I will arise and go to Jesus he will embrace me in his arms In the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are ten thousand charms, oh, there are ten thousand charms, oh, there are ten thousand charms. That's the invitation, and that's the promise. And can I give you some good news this morning? I want to give you good news, and I'd invite you just to announce this with me. Would you all read this verse with me? It'll be up on the screen. This is Jesus' word to you when you come. In 1 Peter 2.24, it says this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Will you stand and sing this song with me? One day filled with his praises one day when sin was as black as could be Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin dwelt among men my example is he the word became flesh and the light shines among us, His glory revealed. Living, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. Buried, He carried my sins far away. Arising, He justified freely forever. One day, He
Jesus is mine. Yes, Jesus is mine. Jesus, we look forward to your coming. We say, come quickly, Lord. Thank you for being near to your people. You are Lord God. You are king of the universe, king of creation. Your spirit has breathed life into creation. And you're continuing to renew the face of the earth. Your spirit breathed life into the scriptures. And so we pray this morning that you will continue to speak your word to us. Your spirit breathes peace and comfort to the whole world. Lord, make that true here among us today. Through Christ's name, amen. One of the things that our church does that you did long before I got here, and I hope you'll do it long after I'm gone, not that I'm planning on leaving anytime soon, but this is something important that we should all be doing, is we have this deal called Dinner for Eight. And the purpose of Dinner for Eights, each year we put together groups of intergenerational, well, they're intergenerational groups. So believers from, you know, we do Sunday school and grow groups together, but usually we're all in the same life stage. 
And so Dinner for Eight is a great opportunity for you to spend time with people in different life stages in our church family. And the way that you do that is there's a, a sign-up. I think they're down at the welcome desk. You can grab one and sign up. If you go home and you forget about it, you can call the church office tomorrow and you can sign up. And then next Sunday night, after, after our time together in here, then we're going to all go into the gym and have dessert together and you're going to meet your Dinner for Eight group. And so then the, the purpose is once a month that you'll have dinner or you'll have a lunch or you'll just get together with this group of people and build some spiritual friendships with people that aren't in your normal circles here in our church family. So that's next Sunday night. First, you got to sign up, but then come next Sunday night. And you don't even have to be a church member to be a part of that. Now, I've got a fact that I want you to consider today. Everyone, everyone who lived prior to the year 1900 is dead. Everyone who ever lived in the year before 1900, they're all dead now. And I say this to remind you that death is inevitable for every one of us. If the world continues on its present course, a hundred years from now, every one of us in this room will be dead or nearly dead, right? Some of us a lot sooner than that. I won't mention any names, but <laughs> you know who you are. But, but that's a reality for all of us. A hundred years from now, we're all going to be gone. And yet, despite the inevitability of death, most of us are not comfortable thinking about it. Most of us don't want to talk about it. Very few people in our world today are good at handling the reality of death. Even when it happens to somebody we know, we want to move past it quickly. We want, so we, we want to put it as far from our minds as possible. So we fill our time with our free time with hobbies or entertainment. We fill our schedules with projects. Anything to distract us from the reality of death. I read a story about a little girl named Zoe. Zoe was three years old, and, and she had a pet turtle. And one day, her pet turtle died, and Zoe was inconsolable. She, just, she couldn't stop crying. Her dad tried to reason with her. He said, we can go to the pet store. We can get another turtle. Or, that didn't make her happy. She wanted the turtle that she had. Finally, her dad had a brilliant idea. She said, what if we, what if we have a funeral for your turtle? Now, being three years old, Zoe didn't know what a funeral was. So her dad explained. He said, a funeral is it's kind of like a party to honor your turtle. He said, we can have ice cream and cake. We can get some lemonade and have some balloons. We can have all your friends come over and play. Zoe's tears dried up, and she began to get excited about this party, this funeral party. And then the turtle moved. It wasn't dead after all. It started walking around like turtles do. Her dad didn't really know what to say, but, but Zoe did. With all the innocence of a three-year-old, she looked up at her dad and said, Let's kill it. <laughs> Death is inevitable. Whether you're a human or whether you're a turtle in the way of a party, death is inevitable for all of us. So my question for you this morning is, what's your plan? If you can't avoid it, if it's coming, what's your plan? Have you thought about it? Are you, have you prepared for it? Are you ready for it? There was a mother talking to her child that had just lost her father. And the mother said to her child, she said, Honey, God sent for your father to come to heaven with him. And someday God's going to send for you and me. Well, we don't know when that's going to be. And the little girl responded, she said, but mom, if we don't know when God's going to send for us, shouldn't we pack now? And I think that's a great, that's a great thought. Shouldn't we pack now? If God could send for you at any time, if you could die at any moment, shouldn't you get ready right now? Shouldn't you go ahead and pack? Shouldn't you think about what's coming and be prepared for it? Well, as God's children... We need to know what God has promised us as we face death. And that's what our story in Daniel 6 is all about today. So would you turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6? I'm going to invite Meredith to come and read our scripture passage for us. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word and follow along as Meredith reads? Daniel 6, 10 through 28. 
When Daniel learned that the document had been signed, he went into his house. The windows in its upstairs room opened toward Jerusalem, and three times a day he got down on his knees, prayed, and gave thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel petitioning and imploring his God. So they approached the king and asked about his edict. Didn't you sign an edict that for 30 days any person who petitions any god or man except you, the king, will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, as a law of the Medes and Persians, the order stands and it's irrevocable. Then they replied to the king, Daniel, one of the Judean exiles, has ignored you, the king, and the edict you signed, for he prays three times a day. As soon as the king heard this, he was very displeased. He set his mind on rescuing Daniel and made every effort until sundown to deliver him. Then these men went together to the king and said to him, You know, your majesty, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no edict or ordinance the king establishes can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing in regard to Daniel could be changed. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him. He could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God, the king said, has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke with the king. May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they haven't harmed me, for I was found innocent before him. And also before you, your majesty, I have not done harm. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to take Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was brought up from the den, he was found to be unharmed, for he trusted in his God. The king then gave the command, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the lion's den, they, their children, and their wives. They had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to those of every people, nation, and language who live on the whole earth, May your prosperity abound. I issue a decree that in all my royal dominion, people must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. He rescues and delivers. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth, for he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. This is God's word. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would guide us today into your truth. Teach us from your word the hope that God has provided and how we can live in light of that hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Daniel 6 contains one of the most famous stories in the Bible, Daniel and the lion's den. And I want us to look at three aspects about this. So if you have a a bulletin, a worship guide, and you're doing the fill in the blanks, here's the first ones, number one, two, and three. Number one, we're going to look at the story, the story itself. Number two, we're going to talk about the point of the story, the point of the story. And then third, why it matters why it matters. So let's start by looking at the details of the story. So in verse 10, we see Daniel's faithfulness in the face of danger. It didn't matter what laws were passed. Daniel's allegiance belonged to God alone. The only accusation that could stick against Daniel was that he wouldn't stop worshiping his God. That was the only mud that anybody could sling at him. He won't stop worshiping God. Could somebody sling that mud at you? Would it stick? The only thing they won't stop doing is worshiping their God. You know, Daniel's faithfulness was an example to several writers later in the New Testament. You can find references to him in Hebrews 11, in 1 Peter 5, and 2 Timothy 4. 
Each of these writers looked at Daniel's story and they realized that God does not promise to save his people from earthly trouble. God doesn't promise to save us from earthly trouble. God did not save Daniel from the conspiracy of the evil men. God did not save Daniel from being thrown into a lion's den. Remember now, Daniel's in his 80s here. Some of you are in your 80s. Probably just getting thrown anywhere would be bad for you, wouldn't it? God didn't save Daniel from being thrown into a lion's den. We need to know that there will always be a cost in following Jesus. There will always be a cost to follow Jesus. Now, if you think, if you personally think, I don't really know that it's cost me anything significant to follow Jesus, you need to take a hard look at your life and make sure you're actually following Jesus. Because Jesus said things like, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. Jesus said things like, you will have suffering in this world. Jesus said things like, the world will hate you. God's people, we must be prepared for the cost of following Jesus. There will be times in your life when God will lead you to turn your back on something that you want, to turn your back on something that's important to you, to give something up to follow Jesus. Faithfulness to God will always cost us something. Now in verse 11 of Daniel, we see we see the opponent's accusation. So these administrators, these overseers, they got this law to pass, and then they were spying on Daniel. They're spying to see if he would pray to his God. And as soon as they see it, they go tell the king. Tell him Daniel's disobeying the new law. And in verse 13, you might miss it, but there's actually an ethnic slur in verse 13. They say about Daniel that he's one of the Judean exiles. Now, the destruction of Judah... And the exile of the Israelites happened 70 years earlier. There was no reason to bring that up except to point out that Daniel wasn't one of them. They felt like Daniel didn't belong. Their prejudices revealed. They weren't just accusing Daniel for what he'd done. They were accusing him because of his race. Daniel was the victim of racial hatred and envy, which many Jews have been throughout history. And in verses 14 through 20, we see the king's distress. King Darius realized he's been tricked. And it, did you notice what it says? It says he set his mind to rescue Daniel. He went all out to figure out a way to get Daniel out of this, but he was backed into a corner. There was no way out. The most powerful man in the world, his hands were tied, and he couldn't do anything about it. So Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. And the king can only stand by helplessly and in verse 16 offer a prayer, a hope that Daniel's God might rescue him. And then a stone is placed over the entrance of what everybody expected was going to be Daniel's tomb. Because when you feed somebody to the lions, there are no remains to bury after that. This would be Daniel's tomb. There was no earthly hope for him. And then at this point in the narrative, we don't stick with Daniel. We follow the king. We don't get a picture of what happened in the lion's den that night. Instead, verse 18, we stay with the king through his evening. He can't sleep. He, he spends the evening fasting, no diversions. His thoughts are all on what's going on in the lion's den. What would he find there in the morning? We're left in the dark with the king. And at first light... He's up and running to find out. Look at verse 20. It says, When he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you continually serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? And then in verses 21 through 23, we see the rescue by God. The king hears Daniel respond, and he rejoices. Daniel shares that God sent an angel to shut the mouths of the lions that night because he was innocent. And verse 23 makes clear why Daniel was unharmed. It says, for he trusted in his God. For he trusted in his God. Even though evil men had conspired, had plotted against Daniel, what they meant for evil, God turned into something good. 
This brings us to a truth that I'm going to point out to you three different times this morning. If you have your, your bulletin there, it's in bold. And I want you first to look at this truth and see it applies to Daniel's life. Those who persevere in faithfulness to the end, God will protect in death and bring forth to new life. That's what Daniel experienced. He was faithful all the way to the end. God protected him in death and brought him to life out of what everybody thought couldn't happen. And God used Daniel's situation to show everyone there that day his power. Everyone present that day knew that God had flexed. They knew that Daniel had been saved by God's power alone. And in verses 24 through 28, we find the epilogue. So the punishment the evil men had devised against Daniel was turned on them. And lest anybody think that the lions didn't eat Daniel because they weren't hungry, verse 24 tells us that's not the case. They were hungry. And there's a warning here in these deaths. The warning is there are consequences for rejecting Daniel's God. There are consequences for rejecting Daniel's God. There is no rescue apart from him. Then King Darius sends out a letter to everyone in his kingdom. And look at the attributes he, he mentions about God. Look at verses 26 and 27. He's, he calls him the living God, which was in contrast to the gods of the Medes and the Persians who were just stone and wood. They couldn't help a person in a moment of trouble. If you were being thrown into a lion's den... Those gods can't help you. King Darius calls him the God who endures forever, the God whose kingdom will never end, which is the theme of this whole book, the theme of Daniel. Kings and kingdoms will pass away except for the eternal kingdom and dominion of our God. And then in verse 26, Daniel, not Daniel, Darius commands everyone in the kingdom to tremble in fear before Daniel's God. Now it's true that if you come face to face with Daniel's God, you will tremble in fear if you are an enemy. If you are his enemy, you will tremble in fear of this God. In fact, there's a picture in Revelation 6, Revelation 6, where it says that the people of earth, the most powerful people on earth, call to the mountains to fall on them, to hide them from the wrath of God. The enemies of God rightly tremble in fear before him. But the fear of the Lord means something different for us. The fear of the Lord means something different for God's people. Turn in your Bible to Psalm 147. Psalm 147, and you need to underline this. Psalm 147, verse 11. Throughout the Old Testament... There, there's this recurring phrase, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, and it's always attached to God's people. And God's people are supposed to fear the Lord, and, and I think there's a lot of confusion about what it means to fear the Lord. Psalm 147.11 clears that up for us. Look at Psalm 147, verse 11. It says, The Lord values those who fear him, those who put their hope in his faithful love. And what you need to know about Hebrew poetry, like in the Psalms, is these two phrases are synonymous. It's, it's a restatement. So the phrase, those who fear God, is synonymous with the following phrase. The following phrase tells us that what it means to fear God is to put our hope in his unfailing love. That's what it means to fear God. Those who fear God means those who trust God and trust his love. If you have, you're filling in the blanks. For God's people, to fear the Lord means to trust him and his love. That's what it means to fear the Lord. When you see that, when you read that in the Bible about God's people, when you say, it says fear the Lord, you need to think trust the Lord, trust his love. That's what it means for us as God's people to fear him. Daniel feared God by trusting and obeying. Just like the hymn says, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and to obey. That's what it means to fear God. And so the narrative of Daniel is complete here. At the end of chapter 6, we've seen Daniel go from being a captive teenager to the prime minister of the most powerful nation in the world, all because he was helped by his God, he was faithful to his God. 
Now, what is the point of this story? Why was it written down? What is it there for? Well, it was written to remind us of this truth. We need to know that God rescues his faithful servants. God rescues his faithful servants. Verse 23 made that clear, why Daniel was saved, his faithfulness. This story emphasizes, actually all the stories, the first six chapters of Daniel, emphasize that God can deliver where man cannot. And remember who this was written to. This was written to the first Jewish readers no longer had a nation, no longer had a homeland. All of that was destroyed and taken from them. As they read these words, they would have been encouraged to trust their God, to trust their God in exile, that God was still there, he was still at work. But it wasn't just written for those first readers. This story was written to point to Jesus. This story was written to point us to Jesus. There's this, this passage in Luke 24. So after Jesus has been crucified and he's risen from the dead, he's visiting with some of his disciples. You read this in Luke 24, 27. And it says, Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted for them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. Jesus took the prophets, which Daniel is one of the prophets, and he showed his disciples how the book of Daniel is about him. How is it about Jesus? Because Daniel, as a faithful servant, is a prototype of God's faithful servant to come, of the greater Daniel, the greater servant to come. And there are a lot of parallels between Jesus' experience and Daniel 6. But Jesus was a little different. Okay, so Daniel here in chapter 6, he was falsely accused by jealous men. He was sentenced to death, but then he was rescued. He didn't actually die. But there was no such rescue for Jesus. Jesus was falsely accused by jealous men. Jesus was sentenced to death, but then he was handed over soldiers to be beaten and tortured and crucified. No angel showed up to stop the mouths of the lions on Jesus' behalf that day. Daniel might have faced the trauma of a near-death experience. Jesus was actually tortured all the way to death. Now, as I've already mentioned, Daniel 6 tells us that Daniel was rescued because he was innocent, because he trusted God. But Jesus was more innocent than Daniel was. Jesus trusted God further than Daniel did, and yet he wasn't rescued. He wasn't rescued. But the reason that Jesus wasn't rescued is so that all of us could be. There's a, there's a place, I think it's when the crowd comes to get Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he tells his disciples, if I wanted to, I could call on legions of angels right now to come and put a stop to this. He had the power to get out of it. He didn't. Because if he didn't go through with that, none of us could be rescued. But because Jesus wasn't rescued, all of us can be. And when Jesus was on the cross, he quoted Psalm 22. Psalm 22 begins, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I'd encourage you to read Psalm 22 today. And note, there, there's a myriad of predictions and prophecies about Jesus' crucifixion in Psalm 22. But of particular interest for us this morning is verse, seven, is verse 13, which says, They open their mouths against me, lions, mauling and roaring. And verse 21, Save me from the lion's mouth. Jesus faced the lion's den, but no one came to save him. And just like in Daniel's story, a stone was placed over the entrance of Jesus' tomb. They placed a stone over his grave, sealing him in, closing the chapter on Jesus of Nazareth, or so they thought. But it wasn't the end for Daniel, and it wasn't the end for Jesus. Because not only does Daniel point us, his trouble and suffering point us to Jesus, but the way God rescued Daniel points us to the way that God resurrected Jesus. The early church fathers, Daniel 6 was one of their favorite passages to preach the resurrection from. 
Because what looked like a death, sealed with a stone, was turned into the miraculous triumph of God. Same picture, Daniel 6 and Jesus' resurrection. Now I want you to look back at that statement in bold on your bulletin. And now I want you to realize that it applies to Jesus. Those who persevere in faithfulness to the end, God will protect in death and bring forth to new life. That's what Jesus experienced. Jesus was raised from the dead. And our entire faith, our entire religion depends on that one fact. If Jesus was not raised, our faith is worthless, but he was. And that has implications for you. Have you ever been reading the news or listening to the news and heard about something far away? Maybe you hear about rolling blackouts on the East Coast and they're losing power for days at a time. Does that really affect you much? It's just in one, in, in one ear, out the other. You see it and you go on. You read about a million pounds of chicken have been recalled in California. Just in one ear, out the other. Not a big deal. It doesn't affect my daily life. All that kind of thing, it's just information without any implications for us. But what if you heard on the, on the news this week that the power grid in western Oklahoma was going to be down for three days this week? Would that change your life? Yeah? What if you heard that all of the chicken in Oklahoma was contaminated? Would that have any effect on you? It has an effect because it's information that has implications for us. The only way that you will ever engage with the hope of resurrection is if you realize the implications it has for you. Otherwise, you'll just hear it as information, not really a big deal. But when you realize how it affects you, it will change you. Why does it matter for you? Why does Jesus' resurrection matter for you? Because of what I talked about at the very beginning. Every one of us in this room are under the doom of death. We can't avoid it. Because of our sin, we deserve not only physical death, but we deserve a spiritual death. We deserve to be separated from God for eternity. And the problem with that is that God is the source of everything good. Anything good that you like about life comes from God and His grace. The Bible calls the destiny separated from God and his goodness, it calls it hell. And hell is described as a place of horror, a place of torture, a place where all meaning and hope is gone, a place where there is nothing good, where there is nothing redeemable anymore. Now some people, especially people in our world today, they think that that kind of eternity sounds unfair. They want to know why God would condemn people to that kind of fate forever. It's the next fill in the blank for you. This is an important thing you need to know as a Christian. Hell is simply God giving people what they have asked for. That's what hell is. Hell is God giving people what they have asked for. Because people don't want God and his influence in their lives. They don't want to submit to what God says is right and good and holy. They want to be free of God. But they don't realize how everything that they love about life is the result of God's goodness and grace. That if you take away God's presence, there's nothing of value left. Hell is the final state where God gives people the very thing they've been asking for. He completely and permanently withdraws his presence from them. They get existence without God, which is what they want. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says there's only two kinds of people in the end. There are people who say to God, thy will be done. And then there are people that God says to them, your will be done. You can have existence without me if that's what you want. C.S. Lewis says, all who are in hell, choose it. This is why resurrection matters. Resurrection is God's great escape plan from that place. Hell is the fate all of us deserve. It's the enemy that you can't defeat on your own. Your only hope is that God will do something powerful 
to change your destiny. That's why you need resurrection. I love, one of my favorite books in the Bible to read is the book of Isaiah. And I love to read Isaiah because along the way, there are these these little glimpses pop up in the book of Isaiah of restoration to come, of what God promises to do someday. I was reading, this is somewhere in the 30s, I don't remember which chapter in Isaiah, but I was reading this week and I wrote down what it, what it talked about. Listen to what God promises to do with restoration, with resurrection. He has this picture of a dry wilderness, of a desert, and then all of a sudden it starts blossoming. All of a sudden, it starts transforming into a forest with springs and streams. Can you picture that? A desert, all of a sudden, magically just watching it transform and start being productive and beautiful. God talks about restoration to come. He says, in in terms of the blind, will start seeing. That people who can't hear will start hearing. That people who, who can't talk will start singing. That people who are lame will start leaping and then there's this picture at the very end of that chapter where god says joy and gladness will overtake them would you like that to happen in your life to be overtaken to be pursued and overtaken by joy and gladness that's what resurrection and restoration is you being overtaken by god's joy and by the gladness that comes from him And the good news is that God offers that to us. He offers restoration and resurrection to those who place their faith in Jesus and submit to him as the rightful king. Physical death is the end game for all of us. And you can either face it alone or you can face it with the one who defeated it. 1 Thessalonians 4 puts it this way. It says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way, God will bring with Jesus those of us who have died. Jesus will descend from heaven with a shout, the archangel's voice, the trumpet of God, and then the dead in Christ, those who have trusted him because they're in Christ, the dead in Christ will rise first. When Jesus comes, he's going to rescue us completely from the power of sin, from the presence of sin, and even from death. And that's such good news. The king's words to Daniel in chapter 6, verse 16 will be true of us. Our God, whom we continually serve, will rescue us. And God will be the hero. We can't take any credit for it. You've you've all seen probably the first Star Wars movie. Princess Leia is sending out a message to Obi-Wan. She says, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Why? Why? You're my only hope. Your only hope is Jesus and resurrection in him. That's it. If you put your hope anywhere else, it will, you will be disappointed and actually more than that, be destroyed. Your only hope is Jesus and resurrection. So I want you to look one last time at that bold statement on, on the bulletin. That bold statement is true about you. Those who persevere in faithfulness to the end, God will protect in death and bring forth to new life. And since resurrection is true for us, we can live with joy and power today. Nothing in this world is able to permanently steal our joy. Since resurrection is true, any of us could be thrown into a lion's den and not have to fear it. Any of us could be called by God to love difficult people and not demand that they reciprocate. Any of us can give away our money in eye-popping proportions Any of us can spend ourselves in service to God without holding anything back because we know that God will protect us in death and bring us forth to new life. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for this story from Daniel 6, which reminds us of resurrection and restoration to come, that out of death, you will bring life. You will bring new life, restored life. And we are grateful as your people to be a part of it and to have that promise. And I pray you'd help us to live in light of it. 
to be filled with joy because of it, to not just have the information, but to realize why this information matters, that it would change who we are and the way that we live. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? I was reminded this week of something that what we do here and, and right now, this time, specifically this time right now, when we sing a song after the sermon, it, we call it a time of response. And the invitation is for you to respond to what you just saw in God's word. That's what all of us should be doing right now, is thinking about what we heard from God's word, committing ourselves to it, changing accordingly. But I was reminded that, you know, sometimes people come in here and you've got some difficult things that are going on in your life. You might be walking through a difficult season with, with illness or circumstances or something hard is going on. And you just, you would love to have somebody pr to pray with you. So what I'm going to do is I wanted to invite, Kenny, if you would actually come stand down here and Roger's going to be here right now. If you just want somebody to pray for you during this song because you've got a lot on your mind on your plate come down talk to one of these men share with them briefly and they will pray for you if God is working in your heart and you're saying I don't know that I I don't know for sure that resurrection is in my future then come talk to me this morning if you want to join our church family if this looks like a place you would like to be for a while and put down roots come talk to me but that's what this time is for, is for all of us to respond in one way or another to what we've heard from God. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The is written, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that 
something to celebrate. You all can be seated at this time. Uh, I'd ask our ushers to come forward for the offering. For the love that you uh, showed us on the cross and giving up yourself for each and every one of us, Lord. And Lord, I pray that uh, as we go forth this week, Lord, that we would uh, uh, show what we have through you to others, Lord, and your love would shine through each and every one of us, Lord. Lord, I also pray that you would just uh, bless these tithes and these offerings, Lord, that would be used to further your kingdom and your word to everyone, Lord. Amen. Sing with me, there is no other. There is no other. So sure and steady, my hope is held in your hand. When castles crumble and breath is fleeting, upon this rock I will stand. Upon this rock I will stand. Sing glory. Glory, glory. We have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. We raise the anthem. Our loudest praises ring. We crown him. Oh, 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 oh,
is better make my heart believe every victory in every victory Jesus is better make my heart believe than any comfort Jesus is better is better make my heart believe we declare our souls declaring Jesus is better make my heart believe our song eternal Jesus is better make my heart believe glory glory we have no other king but Jesus Lord of all we raise the before we're dismissed. All right, first of all, I already mentioned adopt a college student. If you'd like to pick one of those up, those sign-ups are on the back. Um, also, starting next Sunday night, we don't have anything going on this evening because of Labor Day, but next Sunday night, we will kick off our Sunday nights uh, in the fall. So there'll be a kind of a time of study in here. They'll be going over, why am I a Baptist? Okay, so many of you may have just joined a church, and hey, it was the closest one to my house. I jumped in, but as Baptist and partly Southern Baptist, is that what does that mean? What what is the history behind that? Why do we make stands on certain things as a group? And so we're going to begin to walk through that. That'll be the Sunday nights at six. You can bring your kids, uh, and we'll actually be upstairs in the student wing starting next week. We'll be kicking off our, our Grove. Um, service with the children's ministry. Um, so that's next Sunday night. You can bring them up here. Also, we have some signups for this week for Meals on Wheels. We need some help filling those gaps. There's about four um, spaces this week that need to be filled. So if you can help with that, we'd greatly appreciate it. And once again, just a reminder of the dinner for eight, sign up, either sign up and give your form here or call the church office this week so we can get those divvied up this week. All right, thank you. I believe we have a dismissal song. He's going to do one because I asked, so we're going to go. <laughs> Let's go out singing, uh, celebrating the res resurrection. Let's sing hallelujah, our living hope. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost 
its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my worshiping with us this week. We'll see you next week.